since I did the first set of videos on masks, a lot has changed. So I thought it's probably about time to revisit the subject. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 108 of Understanding Darktable. When I first started using Darktable in 2016, one of the first things that really caught my eye was the masking in Darktable, particularly the parametric masking, which back then, Lightroom had nothing even remotely close to that. I don't even know if it does today. I haven't looked at it in six years. But like I said in the intro, a lot has changed with the masking tools in Darktable since I did what was it, episodes 13, 14, 15, 16, and then I think I did part five around about episode 36 or something like that. A lot's changed since then, because that was, oh, that would have been Dark Table 2.4, I guess, maybe 2.6. So I figured, yeah, time to revisit. So I've just got this random image uh, of a 39 Hudson taken in uh, city of Napier in New Zealand many years ago and I'm just going to use this as a guinea pig image so in this video we're going to talk about the uniform blend mode and the drawn masks mode and I will leave parametric and then the combination of drawn and parametric for subsequent videos and there's probably a few other bits and pieces that I'll do in a fourth video at least but at this point in time, based on past history, I'm not going to say how many videos are going to make up this series because we all know how that ends up. All right, so the uniform blend mode or uniform masking, if you like, is the round circle. So the X basically means turn off the masking for this particular module. You will find this series of icons on the bottom of every module in Darktable. Well, shouldn't say every module, but most modules in Darktable. So the first one is the uniform mode. And if we turn that on, we will see that the very first option is to choose the blend mode. Now, every time I have tried to wrap my head around blend modes enough so that I could do a tutorial on them, I always end up just a little bit bamboozled by the maths. So what I'm going to suggest is if you need a bit of a refresher on how the blend modes work, hit up the page of the manual on darktable.org because it goes through it all. Basically, you can choose any of those blend modes if you know what you're doing. Next to that, we have a toggle button that allows us to reverse the operation of the blend modes. Normally it is a case of the output is blended with the input. This toggle allows you to reverse that so the input is blended with the output. How you would use that? I will leave to your own devices to play with that and see how it affects the images that you are working on. And the only other control we've got for the uniform uh, mask is an opacity slider. So the only way we're going to see anything happen here is if we enter some other blend mode. So let's just go multiply. We know it's going to darken everything, and it does. And now the opacity slider will allow us to just gradually dial back the intensity of that multiplied blend. Now, if we chose something like divide, which generally makes things lighter, as we can see, it's pretty much blown everything out to white. As we reduce that, we are gradually reducing the impact of that blend mode until we get to zero and we're back to our original image. That's pretty much all I can tell you about the uniform mask mode. So let's move on to drawn. This is a massive topic all by itself, simply because there are so many controls here. In terms of shapes, we can add a circle, an ellipse, a path, a brush stroke, or a gradient 
mask. So let's start with a circle. It is, as the name suggests, circular. Now, I do want to bring one thing to your attention with regards all of these drawn masks. They are applied on the raw data at the beginning of the pixel pipe. Now, I say the raw data, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are working on a raw file. I simply mean that the mask is applied on the data coming from the actual image file, whether it's a raw file or a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG, it doesn't matter. Now, the reason I bring that up is because if you apply any module which introduces distortion to pixels, so things like lens correction or perspective correction, those things occur later in the pixel pipe. And it is conceivable that you could draw a circular mask like so, but because of those distorting modules which appear later in the pixel pipe, your circle will not appear circular. So just be aware if you have added a circular mask and it doesn't look circular, that's why it's happening. If you mouse over the inside of the circle, you will notice that you get a thick red line on the inside and then a dotted red line on the outside. What that indicates is the size of the feather for this particular mask. So the solid red line on the inside is the point at which the mask reaches 100% opacity and the dotted red line on the outside is the point at which the mask reaches 0% opacity. So it is a visual representation of the fall off of the mask. And if we activate this little icon here to the right of mask refinement, the one that looks like a light gray square with a dark gray dot on the inside of it, that will actually show our mask. Now at the moment it's showing no mask at all and the reason for that is because my opacity is still set to zero. So if I bring that up to 100%, ignore this shape here, okay? That's something I've already drawn and we will come to that shortly but for now I just want you to pay attention to the circular mask. As you can see it is solid out to where the solid red line is and then the mask falls off out to where the dotted line is. That's pretty much all there is for a circular mask so let's just right click on that and that mask has now disappeared. If you want it back you can go Control Z but if you don't do it straight away and you do something else then all bets are off. Okay, so if I want to get rid of it again, I will activate the show and edit mask elements icon. That's the one with the little arrow and the dotted line. Right click on the circle and again, it is gone. All right, ellipse shapes. These are, as the name suggests, elliptical. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's the wrong size and it's not oriented the way I want it to be oriented. Don't worry. In terms of the size of the shape, you can simply roll your mouse wheel inside the shape to constrict or enlarge any shape that you've drawn. So this can be a circle, an ellipse, a path, whatever. In terms of rotating an ellipse, you hold down your control key, I guess that would be the command key on a Mac, and you mouse over any one of the nodes, and then you can rotate the ellipse into whichever shape you want and of course without the control modifier you can simply grab a node and adjust the vertical or horizontal dimension as you see fit. Again we've got that fall off between the inner hard line and the dotted line on the outside. Now I said a minute ago that this feather denotes the point at which the mask goes from 100% opacity inside the dark red part of the path out to 0% opacity when it hits the dotted part of the path. What if the inside part of the path we don't want to be 100%? What if we actually want to reduce the opacity of the strongest part of the mask? Not a problem. Simply hold down the control key, use your mouse wheel, and you'll notice at the top there you get a little text 
tooltip that tells you the opacity that you've got for the internal part of the mask. So you can dial that up and down as you so require. All right, let's get rid of the ellipse and let's try a path. We click on the path tool and you must have at least three nodes to a path before you can close it. So left click, draw, left click, draw, left click, and then right click to close the path. So now we have a closed path with three nodes in it. If we want to change the size of the feather, it is shift and mouse wheel, and that will, ever so slowly, grow the size of the feather. You'll notice that the path as it passes through each of these nodes is a curve. Sometimes you don't want it to be a curve. Sometimes you want a hard corner. To do that, mouse over a node and control click twice and you will get a hard corner. If you need it to go back to being a soft corner, you can simply control click once again. Once you have selected a node that has a smooth path running through it, you will also get this control handle, which allows you to define the shape of the path as it passes through that particular node. You'll also notice that there are nodes on the feather. You can click on those to control the intensity of the feather for just that part of the path. So if you want that to be bigger, you can do that. And they can be quite fiddly to actually get your mouse onto sometimes. <laughs> Adding nodes. So let's suppose you've closed off a path and then you suddenly realize, oh, I need another node in this path and it needs to be in this line section here. Control click and that will allow you to add a node to that part of the path. And again, you have all of the usual controls for that particular node. If you've added the node, then you suddenly think, oh, hang on. No, I didn't need that node after all. You can simply right click on the node and that node will disappear. Be very careful though, because if you right click on any part of the path, but not on the node, you will actually delete the path. Now, that can be frustrating if you've spent a lot of time working on the path and then suddenly you go, ah, what happened to my path? Well, what you can do is go over to the mask manager and find the path that you were working on, which will generally be the last path that you drew. And you can then, once you've identified it, because at the moment, that's not active. We've simply identified it from the mask manager, but we've not actually made it active in this image. To do that, we would come over to where it says draw and mask, click on the drop down and select path four. And now that path is back in. Now, I mention the mask manager in this context because sometimes you might suddenly think, this path isn't as good as the path I drew before it. So you might say, well, I want to get rid of this one, but I want to bring back path three. There it is. Or path two. Maybe I don't need three. Okay. So that is working with paths for the moment. There's a lot more to cover. Don't worry. Then we've got the paintbrush. The paintbrush works in much the same way. You have this internal section of the paintbrush, which represents maximum opacity, which again, we can hold the control key and dial down that opacity before we paint, or we can adjust it after we've painted. It doesn't really matter. And then there is the feather outside of the actual brush itself, which again, denotes how quickly the brush stroke falls off from maximum opacity to zero opacity. And again, we can use the shift key to change the size of the brush relative to the mask, or just use the mouse wheel alone 
to adjust the size of both at the same time. So when you're ready to paint, it is simply a case of click and drag and release when you are done and you'll end up with a squiggly line. Now in the preferences under Darkroom, you will find smoothing of brush strokes. It defaults to medium. You can choose low or high. What that will do if you set it to high is reduce the number of nodes that are applied on that path. Now that means you're going to get a smoother curve, but a less accurate curve. So it's all a matter of, you know, personal preference and the project you're working on at the time. Like I said, you can always remove with the uh, right click and add nodes back in with the control click if you really need to. If you, you know, if you've drawn a path and it's mostly what you wanted, then you can just go in and finesse it as you see fit. Okay, that'll do for the brush strokes at the moment. Let's get rid of that. And finally, we have the gradient mask. Now, the gradient mask will, as the name suggests, apply a gradient to your entire image. And you will notice that one side shows maximum opacity, the other side shows no opacity whatsoever. And when you mouse over the solid line in the middle, you can actually see where the feather is. Again, the shift key will allow you to shrink or expand the feather so that you can control the fall off of the mask. And if you hold no modifiers down and you mouse over the solid part of the line, you can then curve the gradient. So if you are working with a wide angle lens and you're trying to map a gradient to the horizon, let's say you're shooting a landscape and you've got a bit of a curved horizon, this is a great way to draw a mask so that it sort of maps along the horizon pretty accurately. Okay, again, control key to reduce the opacity and the shift key, as I said, will uh, adjust the, the fall off. All right. I'm going to leave it there for this video. This is not the end of working with drawn masks. There is more to cover. There is the ability to create intersections between multiple paths. And that is seriously another video. So that will be the next video that I do. And I know I haven't really shown you the effect of these masks. I've really just shown you how to draw a mask. Hopefully you understand that whatever shapes you introduce in whatever module you happen to be working in will allow you to constrain the effect of that module, which in this case is the color balance RGB module, <laughs> to only the areas that are yellow in your masked area. And like I said, that can be turned on and off with this icon to the right of the mask refinement text. So that mask is still there. We are just no longer looking at it, right? So we can just toggle that on and off. One last tip for this video, invert mask will do as the name suggests. It will completely invert the mask so that you can then use this module to process every other pixel in the image rather than what is inside the mask. You're basically saying, I want to use what's outside the mask. All right, that is going to do it for now. In the next video, we will look at how we can combine multiple paths together to make up much more complex paths. Hope that's been helpful. Sorry for the tease. It's just the way it is. As I'm recording this, we are one and a half days away from the start of the Easter weekend. And the following weekend, Kath and I are heading to Fiji for our 20th wedding anniversary. So I will be gone for a week and hopefully come back with a heap of good photos that I can start to share. Uh, so yeah, questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below, you know the drill, and I will catch you in the next one.